Thank you, Seth, and good morning. Our passage this morning is John 20, verses 11 through 18. We just sang our passage, so I'll read it here in a moment. But uh, just to refresh your memory, uh, Mary and the women, not mentioned in John, but in the other Gospels, have been to the tomb, found that it was empty. They were troubled by that. Mary was very distraught. She went and informed Peter and John that the tomb was empty, thinking someone had stolen the body. They came to the tomb, they looked in it, and seeing the grave closed, John understood what had happened, that Christ was raised. Mary had followed behind, and so we read, beginning with verse 11, but Mary was standing outside the tomb weeping. And so as she wept, she stooped and looked into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and one at the feet where the body of Jesus had been lying. And they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Stop clinging to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I ascend to my Father and your Father, and my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came, announcing to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. May the Lord bless this reading of his word and bless our time of studying it together. Let's bow together in a word of prayer. In John 17, 3, Jesus gave a definition of eternal life. It's not only endless existence, not mainly that. It is knowing God. It is a relationship with the triune God, a personal relationship with Christ. And that implies that he is alive, which brings us to our passage, which is about the resurrection, which we've been singing about this morning. The resurrection, an idea summarily dismissed as false in our naturalistic age of science and reason. It's a legend, a folk tale. Now, if that were true, that the resurrection was just a fable, that it had not occurred, would that make any difference to your life? J.I. Packer put the question this way. Suppose that, like Socrates or Confucius, Christ was now no more than a beautiful memory. Would it matter? We should still have his example and teaching. Wouldn't they be enough? There are many in churches this, this morning who would answer, yes, that's quite enough. An article in Newsweek magazine about 30 years ago titled Rethinking the Resurrection stated that 30% of people who call themselves born again don't believe that Jesus came back to physical life after he was crucified. So for many Americans, the beautiful memory is the important thing. They don't need the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. A, a secular, materialistic, rationalistic religion is fine with them. But Paul told the Corinthians that it matters. 
If Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins. And we are of all men most to be pitied. Or, as Dr. Packer put it, a Christ who remained in the grave can still be your hero, but he cannot be your savior. The reason for that is given in Romans chapter 4, verse 25, where Paul concisely explained the cross and the empty tomb. He, Christ, was, raised, was delivered over because of our transgressions and was raised because of our justification. In other words, the cross happened because of our sins. The only way to remove the penalty of God's justice against us due to our sin was by the Son of God suffering the penalty for it in our place. And you can think of it this way. We owe God as His creatures righteousness. Sin takes away righteousness. It puts us in debt to God. It is a debt too great for us to pay. That requires perfection. We cannot give that. Christ came to take on our debt and cancel it by dying for our sins and making us whole with God, right with God, justified. So he was delivered over because of our transgressions to remove them and save us from their penalty. He was raised because of our justification, meaning raised because he obtained justification for us at the cross. The resurrection then is the proof that Christ's sacrifice was accepted by God, that it satisfied God's justice, and that we are now, in fact, justified, forgiven, accepted by him as innocent, and not just innocent, but righteous, righteous in his sight. The resurrection didn't save us. Nowhere does the New Testament state Christ was raised for our sins. The cross saved us. That's where sin was punished. That's where our debt was paid and atonement made. The resurrection is God's announcement of victory. It is His endorsement of His Son's work on the cross. The sign that He accepted His sacrifice for us. So if there was no resurrection, there was no endorsement, no victory. We are still in our sins, as Paul said. There is no eternal life and no relationship with God. We're doomed. But that's not so. The testimony of the apostles and early church is that the tomb was empty so that first Easter morning was the event that showed that Christ was raised. Christ rose. See, and that's the witness of Scripture. And it's well supported. Paul stated at the beginning of 1 Corinthians 15 that Christ not only uh, appeared to the apostles, but on one occasion he appeared to more than 500 brethren at the same time. There have been attempts to discredit all of that. The resurrection has been dismissed as the result of rumors spread by Mary Magdalene who suffered an hallucination. A second century philosopher named uh, Celsus, in a critique on Christianity, dismissed the account of the resurrection as based on the hallucination of an hysterical woman. Others would uh, later use the same argument, but the fact that, that he was trying to disprove the resurrection in the second century is proof uh, from a very early date that the church believed in it, from the beginning. And they believed in it with good reason. Even if Mary's testimony is dismissed, what about John's? He believed in the resurrection before she did. When, when he and Peter came to the tomb, they found it empty and they saw the grave clothes. 
And what about the more than 500 people who saw the resurrected Christ at one time? Was that a mass hallucination? Not likely. And the earliest attempt to discredit the resurrection as being a hoax uh, perpetrated by the disciples, that was the earliest one. They claim, the Pharisees claim they stole the body. It, it, it is also without foundation. They hadn't even comprehended the Lord's statement about the resurrection, which he had given on numerous occasions. They were not expecting it. They had, they had gone into hiding the, the night of his arrest, not to plot a resurrection, but to hide themselves from the authorities. Even if they had stolen the body, would they have devoted their lives to perpetuating a lie? Even to the point of dying martyrs' death? Deaths for a hoax? It's not likely. As John Stott wrote, hypocrites and martyrs are not made of the same stuff. There's only one reasonable, credible explanation for the empty tomb, for the birth of the church, for the spread of Christianity, I should say, the rapid spread of Christianity within that first generation of the church, and that is the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. All of this is to say, the scriptures are clear and the supporting evidence is strong that the resurrection of Christ is an historical fact, an inconvenient fact for a secular world, but one that we can believe. In fact, Princeton theologian Benjamin, Benjamin B. Warfield wrote, no fact in the history of the world is so well authenticated as the fact of Christ's resurrection. It affirms that we have a living Savior, that every believer in Jesus Christ has eternal life, and that means that we have a personal relationship with the Lord God. We learn about that relationship from our passage and the, the conversation Jesus had with Mary Magdalene. The way he dealt with her reveals a lot about his character and how he deals with us. Our text begins with Mary at the tomb weeping. She has returned, maybe drawn back by her grief. Maybe she hoped someone might be there to help her locate the Lord's body. She stood there grieving for a while, then stooped and looked inside the tomb. And there she saw two angels who asked her why she was weeping. The, the idea being there's no reason for it. This was not a time of, of, of sorrow. A time, it was a time for joy. She was looking into an empty tomb, evidence of the greatest miracle of history, and she was sad. It must have astonished the, the angels. It, it it all happened just as Jesus told the disciples it would. He would rise on the third day. There was the proof of it. And she was weeping. In fact, her grief was so great that she didn't realize she was talking to angels. But this was the condition of all the Lord's followers at this time. Despair, because they had not understood and believed his promise. So the angels asked her, woman, why are you weeping? And she answered, because they have taken away my Lord and I do not know where they have laid him. But before the angels could tell her the good news that his body was gone because he had risen, Mary turned to look behind her. Maybe she heard movement, or maybe as John Chrysostom, the fourth century preacher, suggested, the angels saw the Lord and they made a gesture, perhaps bowing. That caused her to turn. Whatever the reason, when she turned, she saw Jesus. She didn't recognize him. 
seeing him was, was the last thing she expected. Sometimes when you see someone you know in a different place where you're not used to seeing them, you don't recognize them immediately. That may have been the case, but, but also his appearance may have been different. This is the resurrected Christ. You remember the two disciples on the Emmaus Road in Luke 24 didn't recognize him either, and they, they spoke with him at length before their eyes were opened, as Luke put it. And here, Jesus began a conversation with Mary. He asked her the question the angels had asked, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? And that question, whom are you seeking, was more probing than Mary may have realized. He asked whom, not what. She was looking for a what, for a lifeless corpse, not a who, not a person. She should have been seeking the living, not the dead. It's a question for today as well. Because as long as people seek the corpse of Christ, they will never find him. As long as they honor a dead hero, they will never know the living Savior. He is alive, not dead. And Mary would soon learn that. But at that moment, she supposed that Jesus was someone else, that he was the gardener. The irony is, she was closer to the truth than she knew. He is our gardener, who tends the garden of his church, someone has said, who sows the seeds of grace and waters them. That's what Paul stated in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 9. We plant seeds, but he is the one who gives the growth, gives us life and causes us to bear fruit. He was the master gardener who was with Adam in Eden in that first garden who walked with him there in the cool of the day when they worshiped together and had fellowship together. And now he's there in this garden. He spoke to Mary in the Jerusalem garden before the empty tomb. But thinking that he was just a servant, she jumped to the conclusion that he might have been the one that removed the body. And so she asked, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. She then turned back again to look at the empty tomb. And that was when the Lord opened her eyes. He did it with one word, her name. He said, Mary. That's all. But that was enough. She knew him immediately, not by sight, but by word. Just like the good shepherd who knows his sheep and calls them all by name, he called her. And she knew his voice because she was one of his sheep. He could have used another word like peace. In fact, that's the word that he will speak to his disciples in just a few verses in verse 19. But he said to her her name to remind her of his unique personal relationship with her. And she instantly responded. Amazed, she turned back to look at him and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Then in her joy, she grabbed hold of him. It was a it was a natural response, but one that the Lord gently corrected. He said in verse 17, Stop clinging to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Now that might be a little bit of a puzzling statement on his part. What, what did he mean by that? Well, obviously he didn't mean that her grasp prevented his ascension. Death couldn't hold him in the tomb. Mary's grasp couldn't have kept him earthbound. And the Lord didn't mean that her touch defiled his resurrection body and would affect his return to heaven because in verse 27, he commands Thomas to touch him. 
put his hand in the, in the nail prints in his hand and his side. Well, Thomas was instructed to do that because he didn't believe in the resurrection. Mary's touch was one of faith and devotion, so it would seem to have been good, not, not defiling. Nor was he speaking of uh, a, an immediate ascension from which he would then return and then be on the earth for the 40 days and then ascend finally from the Mount of Olives. If, if something as significant as that had happened, it certainly would have been recorded, but there's no mention of it. What most likely the Lord was indicating in this uh, gentle, kind rebuke that he gives is <clears throat> he was not returning to his former relationship with them. Things were not going to be the same now. He recognized in Mary's response that she wanted to resume the old relationship she had had with him before the cross. And the Lord was telling her that cannot be. Things had changed. The relationship would be different. It would be better. They would have fellowship and it would be richer. But first he had to ascend to the Father and then send the Holy Spirit. He spoke of this to his disciples in the upper room discourse in chapter 16 and verse 7. The Spirit who had been with them would be in them. And through him, the Father and Son would also live within the believer. Mary needed to understand that. They would resume fellowship, but on an even deeper level through the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit. And so Jesus told her to stop clinging, stop trying to hold on to the old relationship. It was a necessary rebuke, but as I said, one that, that was given gently. His response was, or rather her response was, was natural. It was, it was a response out of affection. And it's hard to fault her for that. She'd received much from him. He cast out seven demons from her. Years earlier, he'd found a, a helpless, tormented person, and he gave her life back to her. And she loved him for it. Loved him for all that he had done for her and loved him for who he is. She thought he was gone. Now he was there before her and she didn't want to let him go. So again, who can blame her? In fact, that's what we need. We need to love Christ with the the, the loyalty and devotion of Mary Magdalene. We need a growing, vital relationship with Him and affection for Him. But we can only have that rightly, correctly, when it is uh, affection, feelings, governed by the truth. Otherwise, it will become emotionalism, which can lead us astray, lead us off the path, and lead us into error. But if we seek to know Him, seek to know Christ as earnestly as Mary sought Him, but seek Him according to the truth, according to the Scriptures, then we will have the right affection. That's what truth produces. That's the sanctifying work of the Word of God. In Luke 24, verse 32, after the two disciples who walked with Jesus on the Emmaus Road realized who it was who spoke to them, they said, were not our hearts burning within us while He was speaking, while He was explaining the Scriptures to us? 
That's how we have a burning heart for the Lord. It is through Scripture. It is through their explanation. It's through the reading and the teaching of it. That's how the Lord speaks to us. That's how He transforms us. And then He uses us in the lives of others. We see that here because that's what He did for Mary. She loved Him and he blessed her by giving her the privilege of being the first witness of the resurrection and then being sent to announce it. So he says to her, go to my brethren and say to them, I ascend to my father and your father and my God and your God. As the first witness of the resurrection, She was to be the first herald of the good news. And not only announce that he is alive, but also tell the disciples that he calls them his brothers. It's a new designation to indicate the new relationship that has resulted from his death and resurrection. It is very personal. They are members of his family. All believers are. In Romans chapter 8 and verse 17, Paul calls us fellow heirs with Christ. There's no greater privilege than that. We inherit the kingdom with Him and rule with Him and will for all eternity. He called them His brothers. And when we remember that only three days earlier, they had all abandoned him, leaving him alone to the enemy, we see all the more clearly his grace and love to them and us. Psalm 103 verse 14 states, He knows our frame and is mindful that we are just dust. He understands their weaknesses. He understands our weakness. He knew it when we were chosen in eternity past. He's known it from all eternity. He knew it when He died for us on the cross. He understood our condition and who we are, who He was dying for. He knows us and is merciful and forgiving. As the author of Hebrews wrote in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 11, He is not ashamed to call us brothers. He never deserts us even though we may desert Him in a moment of weakness. And He is there always to care for us when we stumble and pick us up when we fall. That is our relationship with Him. He made these weak, stumbling men His brothers. He established a new relationship with them making them a part of His family with all of the family privileges in the family of God. That is emphasized in the announcement that he was ascending to his father and their father. God is now their heavenly father. And they could approach him with with confidence, knowing that he would hear them, he would help them care for them, guide and protect them. These are among the privileges that we, we, we all have who have put our faith in Jesus Christ. God is no longer our judge. He is our Father as He is Christ's Father. Now, of course, our relationship with God is not identical with His. He didn't say, I ascend to our Father and our God, but I ascend to my Father and your Father, and my God and your God. Which indicated that while the relationship they had with God was close, it was still different from the relationship that Christ had with Him and has with Him. Christ is the Logos. That's how our fourth gospel begins. God is His Father eternally. 
Theologians speak of the Son of God as eternally generated from the Father, without beginning or end, begotten, not made, very God of very God. So Christ is God's Son naturally, eternally. We are creatures. And so God's sons by adoption, by regeneration and by grace. Jesus is, is like us in his humanity, but different completely from us in his deity. And the resurrection proved that. He claimed to be equal with the Father, and his resurrection proved that he is. Still, while the, the distinction is maintained, the stress is on the closeness of the relationship that we now have, that every believer in Jesus Christ now has with God. And the Lord's first gesture to Mary that morning was an indication of how warm and personal that relationship is when he spoke her name. And in obedience, she left the Lord. She went off to the disciples. It must have been very difficult for her. She was holding on to him. That is where she wanted to be. But the Lord commissioned her, as it were, sent her off to the disciples, and she went. Merrill Tenney wrote, The mourner became the missionary, and a missionary because of her love for him. And so out of that love, she left and went to the disciples. That's what lies behind all obedience, really. All pure obedience. <clears throat> It's not merely a will to obey, knowing this is what I should do, therefore I will do it. It's not something I want to do, but I must do it. I think bottom line, that is true. We, we must do what's right, whether we want to or not. But pure obedience, and the kind of obedience we see here in Mary, was, is obedience out of love for the Savior, which makes obedience natural and makes us, with that kind of heart and attitude, a blessing to others. Those who obey the Lord are always a blessing to others. They may have to do difficult things, but in being obedient, we bless. And Mary is an example. She, she gladly obeyed. I, I, as I say, I think there must have been some something that, that made her want to stay there with him, her love for him, but because she did love him, she obeyed him. And as a result, uh, it was a great blessing for the disciples. She was a blessing to the disciples. They were a defeated bunch when, when she came with the good news that Jesus was alive. Well, maybe John had said something. Now there's a second witness to that. I have seen the Lord, she told them, and then told them all the things that he had said to her. One of those being, I'm sure, what she communicated is that they were his brothers. They were his family. They were his closest companions. And soon he would come to them directly and he would speak their names to them individually. The name is important in the Bible. God's name is important to him. Uh, he knows that our names are important to us. In the Bible, the name generally, very often, represents the person himself or herself. It defines something about them. Abraham is exalted father. Rather, Abram is exalted father. The name is changed to Abraham, father of a multitude. It defines something about the person, and that's true of the Lord. His name defines a great deal about him. We sometimes forget, but uh, a name, I sure do. I don't know about you, when you get to be my age, you're struggling for names every day. But he never forgets. The names are important, and names are important to him. From the least of us to the greatest, he remembers us fully and always. In fact, to the Lord, there are no least among us. We are 
infinitely important to him. He loves each and every one of his believers, regardless of how smart we are and who compared to one another. He loves us all equally because he loves us all infinitely. And there cannot be any degrees within infinity. We're, equal, we're equally and infinitely important to him. As our good shepherd, he knows each one of his sheep. He knows us by name, very personally, intimately. And in Revelation chapter 2, verse 17, he gives an unusual promise to the one who overcomes, to the one who perseveres to the end. He said, I will give a white stone and a new name written on the stone, which no one knows but he who received it. Close friends have special names for each other. They have nicknames. Husbands and wives have such names. Unique ways of speaking to each other that uh, no one else has. Special terms of affection. And we will have that with our Lord. Each of us have a special, unique personal relationship with him. We will have that special, unique, personal relationship with him throughout all of eternity that no one else will share. Your relationship will be unique from the relationship that I will have with him and so forth with all of us. Well, that's a great promise and a great thing to look forward to. Our deep, personal relationship with him personal, private relationship with Him. So we're to be overcoming. Like Mary, we are to be obedient. And God's people are. That's what characterizes us. Not perfection, but characterized by obedience and striving to know the Lord and serve Him. We are overcomers, as Paul wrote in Romans chapter 8, verse 37, we overwhelmingly conquer through Him who loves us. Now that's a statement about grace. We overcome through the work of Christ, but we overcome. Well, the Lord loved us so much that He died for us in order to gain that relationship with us in order to gain forgiveness and life for His people, to gain a personal relationship with Him throughout all eternity. This is eternal life, the Lord said in John 17, 3, that, we, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Do you know Him? If you don't, you are without eternal life. And you have no hope in that condition of resurrection to glory. God is not your father. God is still your judge. But the Lord stretches out his hands to you and he invites you to come. And all who respond and come to him, believe in him and are received by him. They are forgiven. They pass from death into life. So look to Christ if you have not done that. Believe in Him as the Son of God and the only Savior of mankind. And then by God's grace and by His power, live for Him. May God help us all to do that. Well, let's stand and sing hymn number 18 in the Songs of Praise book. In Father, as Your people, we do stand. We stand firm in the faith and in loyalty and obedience to you, but not in our own strength. It's in Christ that we stand. It's in Christ that we have life. It's in Christ that we died and rose again and are seated in the heavenlies at this present time, as Paul puts it. We thank you for that great position and the great condition we have as believers in Jesus Christ all because of what you did in your sovereign grace from eternity past and in time with the sending of your Son and His sacrifice in our place. Thank you for raising Him from the dead and for giving us that resurrection life as well. We thank you for all that we have in Him, 
It is all of your grace, and we give you the praise and the thanks. Now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.